bad habit. Yeah. It's a bad habit. That's what We're not in Oberlin, dude. What are you talking about? Kind of feels like we are right now. Yeah. 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 Oberlin is the university, um, and also London is the university. I think the London program is one of the crown jewels of Oberlin in that it, for me, represents the best of Oberlin. Basically, the way the program works is that it's two faculty members, 25 students, that's it. The chance to be immersed in a serious academic program and at the same time to be able to take advantages of the opportunities that a city like London provides is really extraordinary. Down, 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 deep into the bowels. <laughs> There's very explicit connection between the experience of being in this place and also learning about this place and those things are really the same thing. There's not really a sharp division where the classroom ends necessarily. They live much more independently here than they typically have in Oberlin. And they learn to feel at home in a city, which has immeasurable benefits. We say pants, right? That means underwear. Watching people talk politely about American football was kind of hilarious. Schedule, tomato. You know, all, all the classics. They were interviewing Americans, trying to understand what exactly fo American football was. The British commentator would say something like, oh, well, that was a bit harsh, was it not? I'm not a huge fan of these new stations. They're sort of like brutal architecture. It seems like brave new world to me. So we're going to take the northern line now to uh, Tottenham Court Road. This is Westminster, Westminster Station. It's almost like more of a global metropolis even than New York kind of the original global metropolis, really. You can almost learn more about where you're from, from being here and, and seeing how British history and British culture and all that shapes the United States and all over the place, really. There's some protesters about the NHS reforms, probably, the National Health Service. I, I don't actually live here, but what, what are you... Oh, that's great, we're the Socialist Party. Oh, what are you... What are you, party, you know? what are you petitioning? We're petitioning to stop the Tory cuts. Right. You know, the butcher of Downing Street, David Cameron. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's cutting the NHS. The education. NHS, yeah, we've been following that in our class, oh, brilliant. yeah. That's brilliant. What, are you studying in America? Or we're studying abroad here. Studying here, yeah. yeah. So I imagine you're within the belly of the beast when you're back in America. Yeah. Or what do you mean? Well, the belly of the capitalist machine, almost. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. That is the yeah. heart Well, I'm from New York, so Wall Street, you know. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good luck. Have a good time, man. There you are. Big divisive issue right now. Everyone has an opinion on it. It's, it's causing all this brouhaha. I get a socialist newspaper out of it. So, I'm set. The House of Commons was bombed during World War II. They rebuilt it pretty much exactly the same as it was, which is extremely narrow, because Winston Churchill, who was in power at the time, he liked the idea, he liked the fact that the House of Commons was very narrow, so you'd have people on either side Literally, their spit could touch each other's faces when they were arguing at each other, really up close and personal, which I think is a hallmark of uh, politics in the UK that's different from the, the US. So here we are in the law section where I'll be spending a lot of my time over the next couple of weeks doing research for our projects. Each of us will be presumably living in a different part of this store, but um, right now we're all sort of researching our topics and we're gonna do interviews later. We'll get published by the end of it. Okay, so we're at Borough Market right now and um, we're going to get grilled cheese. It's the best grilled cheese in the world. It's been reviewed in like the New York Times. They put a ton of cheese and a few different kinds of onions on it and it's melty and wonderful. London has all these crazy markets everywhere and this one is particularly like foodie paradise. Yeah. It's really good. <laughs> it's hot. You can like sample from tons of different places and. I don't know, it's kind of like a Costco, but like way better because the food is made by people who care about food. For anybody interested in politics, this is a great place to, to be. Again, because so much of it is visible. We've been reading about education, and there were a bunch of teachers out, protest, out on strike yesterday. Our case is simple and it's just. These are the facts. Since our pension scheme started for teachers and lecturers, 46 billion pounds more has been paid in and has been paid out. But we are going to be very loud about what we're saying to Michael Gove. The Royal Wave. 
It's a program where we bring Oberlin's expectations to London. We use the material and experience that's available to us here in much the same way that we would in a classroom in Oberlin. Look at all the roses. We are speeding along with the car immediately. We've sort of set the pace there. My students are, are taking two courses with me. One course is a course in British modernism, and the other course we're doing is a theater course. We read generally two plays a week and talk about them in the classroom. But then, in addition, we watch the plays, or most of the plays that we read, and then the next day we'll talk about the production side of it. Uh, I want us to talk a little bit about your experience of the ballet, and then we'll talk about Henry V. The course is partly a literature course, but it's also very much a course about performance and uh, the kinds of choices that production companies make to move from the page to the stage. What happened for me was that I stopped remembering that the dancers were actually humans because they were so, like, angular in their movements. We've been to, like, so many shows at this point. I think it's 27 shows total. There was one week where, uh, instead of having class, we would just go to the art museums. I honestly don't think it's possible to see all the plays that we're seeing in London anywhere else in the world. Because all the students are in both classes together with me, we develop a kind of shorthand. They're very engaged with each other and learn from each other, not what you would typically find in a program abroad. Everyone is really invested in their work because, you know, our discussions in class wouldn't be nearly as good if people weren't doing the work they needed to on Tuesdays and Thursdays and weekends. For the modernism course, where most of the works that we were reading are set in London. With something like modernism, so much of it is about all these connections. It was this, you know, incredibly busy, exciting intellectual time where you had people from all different intellectual disciplines meeting and sharing ideas. And a lot of it was taking place here in this city. Well, there's something that's just so exciting about seeing where culture was made at a very specific point in time. It almost feels like you're being a part of that. Hampstead is really a village, and it feels like a village when you get off the, the main street. It was really... You'll be reading a story, you know, one of these modernist stories about locations in the city or even outside of the city, and you can, you know, pinpoint them because D.H. Lawrence will describe, you know, a certain street corner that you pass by every day on the way to class, and you'll see the plaque up, you know, on the wall of the house, and you'll see that, you know, this is where these very important intellectuals were meeting and, and you know, composing their ideas. Wilde brought a, a charge against Alfred Douglas's father for publicly insulting him because he called him a sodomite. He was accused of homosexuality in court and therefore was sent to jail, and that sort of ruined his career. At one point, we visited Greenwich Park, which is one of like the very central locations in a book we were reading, um, The Secret Agent by Conrad. And I just remember everyone, it was like instantaneous, like all 14 of the English kids were just like, oh my God, this is so awesome. And like immediately the book became more exciting. And what's modernist about this is that it sort of exemplifies the notion of form following function. And no, no extra um, ornamentation. That complex was designed by Ernst Freud, uh -huh. Sigmund's son. Uh, the Freuds moved to London in 19... 19th... designed the complex? Yeah, and he designed all the houses. He was an architect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got it. If all the other houses looked like these, you know, it's quite a striking statement. Turn right at the first block past the Leicester Square, you'll find this, okay? What's nice about coming to teach in London is there are enough similarities to the U.S., obviously language. Great, we're gonna start here, which is Marx's third home in London, and end up at his last home. Karl Marx lived the majority of his life in London. It's also different enough that you can ground yourself in the similarities and then really bring differences into relief clearly. Just take note of 68 when we walk by, because Marx actually and his family actually lived here for a while. Academics at Oberlin are incredible, and academics here are just like blowing me away. This is one of the best right. academic experiences yeah. I've ever had, yeah. The first half of the class uh, up till spring break was mostly seminar. Very fast paced. The discussions are very involved, often heated. A lot of class time is devoted to connecting those books we're reading and those seminar discussions we're having with places we visit. When you enter into Marx's room, smoke and tobacco fumes make your eyes water so much that for a moment you seem to be groping around in a cavern. But gradually, as you grow accustomed to the fog, you can make out certain objects which I get to know them extremely well. They get to know me extremely well. The uh, intellectual and social bonding is amazing. He will work day and night with tireless endurance when he has a great deal of work to do. 
So, we're going to go up to Oxford Street. Well, I mean, the class is about class and gender and race. These are things that Oberlin students would talk about even if they weren't in a class about it. The whole notion of class is it's much more pervasive in London than it is in the United States. As the Prussian officer noticed, Marx was often drunk. That's why we're stopping here. Class issues are much closer to the surface, much clearer here, and people are more conscious of them than they are in the U.S. But Britain never had a social revolution, anything like the French Revolution. And as a result, it never had the reaction. We did all these things that we definitely couldn't have done in the United States. We've been learning about the minor strike of 84, 85. We met with, with a number of people who have been involved in organizing that strike, who have been involved in a, in a lot of the stuff that, that's gone on with trade unions. He died at age 11, and the funeral was held here. And Karl Marx was so uncontrollably upset that he actually tried to throw himself into the grave. And he tried to jump in and he had to be pulled out. One thing that I didn't necessarily expect that's been awesome is, is how like interdisciplinary and experiential it's been. We read this novel about the suffragettes and then we met the author because she went to Oberlin and she took us on a tour of uh, Highgate Cemetery where her book was basically like was based. For half of the term, I throw them out into the city and ask them to do a field research project. We have individual meetings with him twice a week and the rest of the time we're just doing our thing. Um, so like I'm probably going to take a trip to Glasgow to meet with a professor at Strathclyde who can get me involved with some call center workers up there. So it gives you the flexibility to kind of take your learning into your own hands, I guess. David Walker and Mark Blecker um, both teach the majority of the classes we take. And then the History of London class is so we can sort of put everything we learn in context, you know, because, you know, all the issues we study in politics have evolved with the city. You can't really separate them from one another. It's taught by uh, a resident Brit, a woman who has a PhD in, in urban history. The focus of this area is exhibitions, museum culture, post-1851. Katie gives lectures on Monday, and we're going chronologically through social history. And then on Wednesday, she takes us to relevant places to what she's talking about. So this is the Natural History Museum. It's designed by Waterhouse, who also designed that great big red kind of Gothic Hogwarts-style building we saw opposite the Staples Inn. He's the reason why Hogwarts looks like it does in the Phelps. That is not Gothic. It doesn't represent any kind of real architecture from the medieval period. It's based upon Victorian Gothic. Which is There's quite a lot to be learned from just getting out on the streets and having somebody knowledgeable talk to you about what you're seeing. This was the site of one of the largest bombs that hit, was dropped on London during... Textbooks are great, but if you're living here and you're studying it, you know, I don't think there's any better place where you can go and actually see a picture, or see, you know, something that you saw a picture of two days ago. This is some of the shrapnel damage from when that building exploded. It blew across the street. It knocked huge chunks out of the building. You can see it all the way up. Usually across London is an amazing city historically because you can still see the imprint of events for like the past thousand years on it. So I think the walking tours are a way to really kind of divorce history from this really strange like mental you know reckoning into something that's very physical and that you can touch and see and smell. Feel free to put your fingers in bomb holes <laughs> if you so wish. You know? Part of the walking tour thing, I think, is to th try to think about what this street would have looked like 150 years ago. It's about trying to transport yourself in time. Forster visited last year, Elvis Huxley, Bertrand Russell, you know, lots of people. America is represented on this statue, and I think you're all going to be very proud. There's a cowboy with a loincloth. <laughs> We're proud to be American. <laughs> Remember, this is the late 19th century. This is only like 140 years ago, but we still represented you in this way. Oh, well. Daniel, do we look like we're having fun enough? <laughs> OK. Everybody's stupid. <laughs> Katie loves us. Katie 
thinks we're mischievous, but knows we have hearts of gold. <laughs> Each and every one. These Oberlin students, fine, moral, upstanding individuals, a credit to America. Can't you tell? We have fine examples here, keen. They always are. I, the last group I had from Oberlin were fantastic too. Very engaged. Um, I think they enjoy themselves. Yes, yes. absolutely. Oh, certainly. You see? What we got from uh, the mining town that we visited. This is a, uh, a union badge. And this one says, revolutions are the locomotive of history. It has to be scanned, actually, I guess, at, by a smartphone. To access a revolution. Yeah, so we have the question. We read the speech that Engels gave at Marx's graveside at his funeral. And it's the best place to read that speech anywhere, obviously. And we should have sat down and had a two-hour seminar about it right there. You could call this shot Squire's Mount. We're all studying the same thing for four months and only this. And so the academics carry out of the classroom. We'll go to pubs and, and continue to talk about class divisions and politics. Um, and we're all sort of coming from the same, the same space and the same previous discussions. And it's, it's basically like it's continuing. When we're, when we're at the pub, it's kind of like we're in class sometimes. When we're in class, it's kind of like we're at the pub. Uh, and often Mark Blecker is in both of those places with us. Some, some friends and I went to a pub we like in Camden and just sat down at one of these long tables. And we just randomly started hanging out with the group next to us, these, these four British dudes. And they were playing this, this, this board game, this card game, right? And they invited us to play. And then, you know, we spent the rest of the evening with them. I think it's different from, like, bars oh. in New York in that it's not, like, something that you do at night to, like, go hard. Like, yeah. you come here after class they, to, like, have a pint. A lot of pubs close at 11 o'clock. So, <laughs> so the point is, like, day drinking, but not in, like, an alcoholic, like, yeah. getting drunk in the park kind of way. It's, it's like, much more it's relaxed. Relaxed. It's relaxed. The yeah. students who've come on this program with me have pretty much without exception, said it was their most important Oberlin experience. I think it's kind of good to have a figure like the Queen, though. The Queen is like, seriously. Right. Why? Back, back that statement off. There's a concept of like a, a being who is not doing anything that hurts you, but is still a figure of authority for, for, for the government. So you're separated. The program is so concentrated and so packed with experiences and events that often they don't really know what they're learning until it's over. She, it's because she's embarrassed by that kind of public spending. The, the monarchy has the sort of galvanizing effect for the country that we're talking about. I always tell my students what I want you to do is to learn to be surprised by the world. The world you live in, the world around you, doesn't have to be that way. It wasn't always that way. It's not that way in lots of other places in the world. It could have turned out very differently. It does turn out very differently in different countries. Be surprised by what's around you and ask, why is it this way? Why does, why does it have to be that way? Why can't it be a different way? Being in a place where the expectations and the assumptions about the world are subtly but importantly different teaches you a lot about yourself. But how is, how is being the conqueror, conqueror of the world like any scarier than anything Americans done? We're being bombarded with all these cool experiences. I don't know, I, I like interact with my friends back home differently now in, in the best way, you know, I, I have so much more to say about it because I can think about it from every single angle and like my brain's been trained to do that now. It's the best teaching I'm ever really able to do because I can work so closely with them and we're so focused. And inevitably, it, it pays off. They will go back to Oberlin significantly more sophisticated as thinkers than they were when they got here. They experience life a bit as if you were a Londoner and, and a normal person and not just a college student. Welcome um, to our flat. Well, yes. Number 24 Hamden House. We have a TV. Yes. Um, yes, this is my bedroom. It's always this clean. Devin is a freak. So we have a stove and a oven and a dishwasher. That is, that's really exciting. And the other, the other room. And now we're yeah. cooking dinner. Yay! So we're, we're gonna make a special kind of salad dressing, uh, uh -oh. grapefruit reduction. Uh, Can we put our music back on? Can we put music on? Is that okay? Yeah, we like Kenny Loggins and we like Rihanna. We like Journey. That's in oh, LA. Yeah, we just Journey. realized that we, we like Journey. <laughs> just a small town girl living in a lonely world. I 
learned how to live in a city. I've never lived in a city before. I'm in a, from a small town in uh, Western Washington, so uh, this is pretty exciting. Uh, London has made me appreciate cities more, just because London is such a unique city. It's London's a, awesome. It's, London's yeah. Oh, it's incredible. It's it's completely different than any other city I've ever been in, actually. Every block has got like layers upon layers upon layers of history. It's this weird combination of kind of it feels kind of like the center of the universe.